The perfectionist is just procrastination in disguise. They're using that as a self-sabotaging behavior to never win. Dan Martell, award-winning entrepreneur, angel investor, and best-selling author. I wanna help entrepreneurs avoid building a business they grow to hate. He has coached over 1,000 plus SaaS founders and is on a mission to help CEOs buy back their time. The moment you write the check, you send the wire, you commit to that, that is when you've just told yourself, I'm worth it. The sooner we can become the people we will become in the future, the faster we get to enjoy that. Learn how to think and live like a millionaire CEO. People have a hard time dreaming because they're worried about, oh, I don't know how to do that. And I would say, Entrepreneurs can also become so accustomed to stressful and unknown environments that they become downright addicted to chaos. Chaos can feel so normal that calm can actually feel strange. Entrepreneurs have been so trained in dealing with stress, like making difficult decisions based on incomplete information and last minute changes, that they're always looking for the next problem, even if it doesn't exist. Without a fire to put out, they go inwardly anxious. Mm. This is a direct quote from your book. Mm. And I love this quote because it speaks so much to what entrepreneurship is today or feels like today, especially somebody who's just starting or somebody who's new into the game. They're trying to hit their first million. That's their life day after day. Talk to us more about it. Entrepreneurs create their reality. And what's fascinating is the world isn't as it is, it's as you are. So for a lot of entrepreneurs, their superpower is their ability to deal with a high level of un uncertainty. It's actually the thing that makes it, you know, when I was working the one job I ever had and I was so opinionated and I had these, these ideas and my boss wasn't listening, that the idea of doing it on my own wasn't even scary because like I didn't need certainty. The challenge with that is that eventually as you build your own business and you have things that are going on and they start to work, you feel uncomfortable because what is comfortable to you is the uncertainty. Everything is now certain. So you will throw hand grenades in your business and create what I call emotional shrapnel because then it gives you something to resolve because that for a lot of entrepreneurs feels safe, feels like home. When things are going too good, they get anxious. I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs, like you said, not only actually now that I think about it, it's like a lot of really successful entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They seem to want to create chaos in, if there is none, like mm -hmm. you kind of said in your, in your book as well. So I'll give you a personal example. And maybe I'm just using you as a coach while I have Let's you do it. on the podcast, I right? So I'm somebody who, who needs chaos mm -hmm. because I like the excitement of starting. Yeah. Like it, it feels good to me. So I found that my sweet spot is the first 20 to 40 million of mm -hmm. the company. The moment it starts to get into operationalized, operationalized, yeah. it's the same product. You've yeah, delivered, know you delivered, you know, like it's like, just keep doing, keep yeah. doing, keep doing. I start to get bored. Mm -hmm. Like it's my mind just doesn't know how to work with that energy. Even if I'm actually pretty good at it, I'm very good at systems processes. That's how yeah, I take it to 2040, yeah. yeah. right? So 20 to 40 is still a lot about processes and systems, but at the point where it's about getting an executive team that has to be like super on point and everything takes legal to kind of confirm what you're doing or a product takes six months to get off the ground. Like my brain doesn't know how to regulate that. Mm. What is it that I should be thinking about or questions I should be asking myself? Or should I even consider that or just say, that's your focus, that's your genius, just focus on it and do that. Keep burn, keep creating chaos. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think everybody should know, you know, it's the know thyself. Right. Mm -hmm. So I love that, you know, this is what makes me happy. Now, without getting too into it, I would also want to know, have you figured out a way to do that and still be an incredible husband, a great father? You know what I mean? Yep. So like, that's the challenge is that what I've discovered is a lot of entrepreneurs that are good at that early stage, they also have a hard time turning it off. And that's the part where I say, does it, does it affect other areas of your life? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that's not the issue, that you can go into that creative headspace, dynamic, a lot of variety, fast pace, and also disconnect, reconnect, all that stuff. Then I would just encourage you to like create a world. That's why the subtitle of my book is Build Your Empire, because an empire for me is a life of unlimited creation you never have to retire from. 
Oh, say say that slowly because I think that should land. This is what people think. So the book, the subtitle is Get Unstuck, Reclaim Your Freedom, and Build Your Empire. And an empire is a life of unlimited creation you never have to retire from. That's beautifully put. I love that. There's no place to get to. It's the beingness of it all. So if you know that's your genius, and I would agree it's what you're great at, then I would sit down with you and say, well, how can we design a world where is whatever hours you want to work? Let's say it's eight hours a day, six hours a day, 10 hours a day, that all you do is your genius. And that is, so is that a venture studio? Is that, you know, Rob Dyrdek with the pro skateboarder? He's got a model where I I forget what he calls it, but uh, essentially he launches a company, I think it's every 18 months. And he just, he just designed a rhythm to, it just it's like how he wants to do it and i just think that that's the that's the journey i would encourage people to go on that's why i I teach these principles in the book because i want to help entrepreneurs avoid building a business they grow to hate because i think that's actually the true destroyer of wealth is an entrepreneur unknowingly climbs the ladder of success and instead of it leaning against that wall it's leaned over there most entrepreneurs will be successful but when they get to that place is it actually providing the intentionality they want in their life, right? Because most, most mm-hmm. entrepreneurs don't not like to create. You love to create, yeah. but zero to 20, cool. Let's design the model where that's all you do all the time. But maybe you might go, well, I like zero to 20, but I don't like having to restart with new teams all the time. So maybe that part I want to keep. Okay, well, let's talk about that. What would that look like? Well, I, I want the same designer and I want the same... Uh, engineer and I want the same lawyer and so okay so now we're going to build some infrastructure but we're going to build a rhythm for creation and expression and that that's what I want every person to do I don't care if your creativity if your outlet is a podcast let's just do the pod do this don't do that Mm -hmm. right like do the thing that only you can do and 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 just try to strive to say like what could I do if this is what I had to do for the rest of my life what if you couldn't retire yeah, and I love that because that's kind of how I and me and Nita, both of us talk about that. I don't think we have the capability to retire because we wouldn't want to sit on the beach and not do anything. We can do that for like five, seven days or maybe 15 days if it really comes to it. And that also looking at our lives, you know, we were just wondering the other day, it's like there's a friend of ours, his name is Colin O'Brady. He has got like 10 world records on his name. And he talks about ones and tens. Mm-hmm. And me and Nita were talking about like, we have so many tens. Like, of course we have ones, pretty much you run a business. You get ones is basically the, the down of your life where you feel like, oh crap, nothing's working. 10 is basically, this is a highlight I want to cherish it. And we were like, we have a 10 every month. It almost feels like is because either we are traveling to a vacation we never imagined, or we are doing something that we never imagined. We are starting a project together, or we are doing something like this, where we reset the whole ecosystem of how we do podcasts and question everything and say, what if we had no barriers? What would it look like? And this is a 10 in a way, right? So, so it's so many 10s. And what I love that you said is that, which is why we never want to retire. It's like, this is just so much fun. There's mm-hmm. no reason to. And, and towards the end of the book, I realize a lot of people don't get to the end of the book, right? A lot of books, people start and they never finish. And a lot of times I find authors actually leave the biggest gem for mm-hmm. the last chapter, right? And it, not that there are tons of gems in Buy Back Your Time, 100%, but there's this gem that I really love where you talk about the seven pillars of life. Yeah, you and went that's great be, to, this yeah. is, I'm glad you found that. <laughs> yeah, the seven pillars of life. And you say health, hobbies, spirituality, friends, love, finances, and mission. And I love that, that you end that. And that's the, that's the way you want to leave people mm-hmm. when the book is ended. It's like, don't just buy back your time from business. You can literally go, oh, that's, you know, my business now, I have only this much amount of time that I have to dedicate because everything is kind of sorted or I've systemized it and so on and so forth. And now health, what's mm-hmm. important to me here? What's my mission? What's my friends and what's my relationship with my friends, my love relationship? It's so important to note how, was there a journey that you realized this? Because I didn't realize it on day one, clearly. I, I burned through everything. I've had a story where I was running Mind Valley and basically work was everything. And that's where I burned my rest yeah. of every category. Like literally I was unsatisfied as hell, which is why I quit everything, uh, including being CEO. And this restarted my life about in 2015. So about 
approximately nine years from, from today. Yeah. Uh, and so that really then is when I finally found that thing. But I had to literally burn everything. Mm. Like I had to be so in the shadow, in the, in the not even once, I would say it's zeros, <laughs> zeros yeah. in a way, uh, empty that then I was like, this is, this is not sustainable. This is not long term. This is just stupid. There is no happiness in being wildly successful and just being alone. Yeah. How I, did you get to it? I had my world rocked when I was 28. You know, I started building companies at 17, all in software, and failed for a long time, seven years. And eventually, I started reading books. It sounds silly. Like, I didn't read books prior to that. I read computer programming books. And I ended up reading a book, and I was so inspired by it that I hired a coach. This guy named Bob from Canada. And Bob taught me the business side. And for the first time in my life, I started to have success in business. It was so bad for seven years. My dad would like beg me to get a normal job. And I just, I was like, I just could never see myself working with somebody for somebody else. I could always, you know, I've always been pretty good at partnering. And the first year, I think we did almost 980 K. It was 24 years old. Wow. So what happened was though in that year, I, I finally got a taste of success, okay? And I was so scared I was gonna lose it that I was like just, I would, I remember we'd get on my calls with my coach and I'd be like, what next? And he'd be telling me this, okay, cool. And sometimes I would not even finish the call. I was just like, I gotta go do it. I was so worried of losing it all. And throughout that journey, four year period, you know, I'm like, you know, unhealthy, 100 hour weeks. Dude, I would go to my friend's birthday parties with my laptop. And, and this is the stupidest part. In my mind, the story I told myself is, I am their best friend. I am so busy. And here I am at their party because that's how much I care about them as a friendship. While I sat there on the couch, blue facing, okay, working on contracts and replying to emails. Like my friends today go, you were the weirdest dude, man, to be around. It's like, I was, <laughs> you were there, but you weren't there. And in my head, I'm like, man, I'm such a good friend. I'm such a good, <laughs> I'm a good person to have around. It's like stupid. And, but that was the only way I knew to be successful. And what happened is throughout the process, I ended up getting a relationship and, you know, I want to have this life. I had a vision board. It's like, I, uh, you know, beautiful wife and family and success and, and all the stuff. Cause I, I grew up with nothing. And this was, I think I'm 27, 28. It was 2008 and I'm working on a Sunday as I, every Sunday, it wasn't even, it was just like normal. I, I went into the office, I worked on mail and like, usually I'd had till about three or four in the afternoon. Then I had to like kind of check in with, with my, you know, fiance at the time. And that day I knew I had to be home because we were supposed to go to her parents' house for dinner. And I'm working and heads down and start doing some research. And when I look up, it's an hour past the time I was supposed to be home. Mm -hmm. And I jump in my car and I race back to this duplex we just bought, okay? And, and I walk in the kit, I walk, I run up the stairs, open the door, and I see her in the kitchen. She's right in front of me and she's beside herself, like just leaning against the, the counter in the kitchen sobbing like ugly girl cry you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like just yeah. like she couldn't she literally couldn't even breathe and eventually she goes she takes the ring off and she just goes i can't do this anymore she drops it on the counter and walks right past me through the front door got in her car, went to her parents' house, and that was the last day we were ever together, seven weeks before the wedding. And I just sat there going like, at first I was like, oh, she's gonna come back. It's not the first time, she's been upset with me. I work a lot, I know I don't see her that much. And when I realized it was done, her parents called me to tell me, you need to know, she doesn't wanna do this, she's done. Cause here's the crazy part. And that's why I put that chapter in the book. She never asked me for any of it. Mm. Okay. Like this is what people don't realize the stuff we're doing. Nobody asked you for. 
And I was like, but this is this is the conundrum. It's like, but I, I'm a creator. I love the 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 ideation, the tough stuff, doing stuff that people say are hard. Like, how do I? I don't know any other way to do it. And that was the hard part for me, where I had to create a system in my life. And and for six months after, I had panic attacks. I was depressed my whole life shattered because everything I had been creating was for this future that now is gone. And I was like conflicted because I thought maybe I'm just gonna have to resolve to being like the cool rich uncle because I probably definitely shouldn't be in a relationship because I'm a horrible partner. And, and all looking back at how I showed up, no wonder she left. But I don't know, man, like nine months, a year later, I just thought maybe, maybe I should do some work around this. And that's where that that's where those seven pillars came from. I, I'm a software guy, so I just asked myself, well, what would need to be true for me to be able to still create, but also have integration? I don't think balance is the right word. Harmony is a better word, but I use integration. And it occurred to me that if every week I just sit down, I check in on these seven dimensions of my life and ask myself one out of 10, how do I feel I'm performing around these areas? And anything that had the lowest two scores, all I did, this is as simple as it can be. I just make a commitment to an action to each one of those lowest scores for the next seven days. So if I have a four on my health, I'm gonna go to the gym. If I have a, a, a five on my mission, I'm gonna redo my vision board. If I've got, you know, my, my relationship or love is a two, I'm gonna schedule a date night, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. that's been this beautiful, simple, elegant tool. Every Friday I do it, where I just assess my life, where I'm at, and I just calibrate it's a very systems thinking oh yeah and it's it's wonderful when you're able to implement it in, in your life yeah what i find a lot of people struggle with is either to start systems thinking or to stick with systems thinking mm. have you worked with such people in some capacity and went oh here is here are the challenges here are the questions here's a thought that one must have when they're struggling with just baseline systems yeah. It could also be their addiction to chaos, like we talked about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thing. Distraction is the ultimate destroyer of wealth. Yeah. Yeah, they're just addicted to distractions, and it could be new projects and be whatever. So he, here's what's interesting to me is I am lucky that at 17, for whatever reason, software programming spoke to me. It literally saved my life. And I talk about this in the book where, you know, discovering it in rehab of all places put me down this path of obsession of developing software, software companies, investing in software companies and building my empire that predominantly is software based. So it's funny is that like I inherently, maybe I don't know how systems thinking I was prior, but that's kind of how the world, world of software, it's logic, it's, 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 it's very procedural. Mm -hmm. And then I run into people that are like creatives and they're like, I like to do it this way and I don't like too much constraints and show me your calendar and oh, I could never do that. That gives me anxiety, blah, blah, blah. Cool. But then I just, I just ask them, okay, like what, what is your outcome you want to achieve? And then let's reverse engineer it. So some of the, the tweaks I've given people is a lot of stuff we have to make other people's ownership. Okay. So for example, if you can't manage your calendar, I would encourage you to have somebody else own your calendar and then they'll be responsible to manage your calendar. But nobody will deny that knowing what my calendar is looks like tomorrow, next week, next month, this year, so that I can have a way to decide if I say yes or no to things, because I know exactly what I'm doing and what I'm saying yes to and what I'm saying no to, right? Because a no is a yes to your goals and a yes is a no to your dreams. Some people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, the, the easiest things that I encourage people to do is just make it somebody else's responsibility. So that's one. The other one is just make it easy to win, right? So like, for example, um, I, l I get rid of decisions, decision fatigues, right? So like a lot of people have a hard time with their nutrition. It's like, for the most part, there's probably three meals you really enjoy eating. How about you just lock and load? Lock and load, like just make those three the great meals. And yeah, you might go out once a week and that's your day that you decide to eat anything off the menu. But for 98% of your time, those meals are delicious, clean, they, they nurture your body and somebody else takes care of it and they're delivered to you and you can do meal prep, you do whatever you want, but just, just remove the decision. And I think that what most creatives that have a hard time with process and systems, they don't realize that in those constraints is actually where the creativity comes from. 
Mm -hmm. right? Like my most creative, innovative ideas have come from lack of resources. So my favorite question to ask people when we're trying to innovate, and this, this is a great question I would ask them. It's like, you know, if you, so think about this, they don't want structure, they don't want systems, they don't want process. Okay, cool. What would need to be true for you to have a high functioning company where you didn't have to deal with systems? Mm -hmm. That's the constraint. We always add the constraints to the question. Mm -hmm. So if the thing is, I know that I want this high functioning business, but I don't like systems, put those two together, ask the question. As soon as you say it out loud, I don't know, I don't know what comes up for you, but I'm like, well, one, I should probably not be the guy running it. Mm -hmm. I definitely shouldn't create an SOP but I know they have to exist. So maybe I should get my team to create them. Oh, that's a cool idea. I never thought of that. Uh, maybe I could hire somebody to come in and create them for us. Maybe I could buy them from somebody. So like all mm -hmm. of a sudden now you start coming up with options. The constraint creates the creativity and they get the desire. See, I actually love creative people, artists specifically. Like, and that's why I wrote about them in the book, the mm -hmm. Andy Warhols and the Oprah's and you know, the, the, you know, the, the authors and the Steve Jobs, because I wanted people to see how you can apply this to very creative industries so that they can express themselves and create more. I want the world to be more full of more creations. Absolutely. And more and more you listen to creative people. There's, um, there's a writer that I was listening to the other day and they shared and they've written like Dan Brown, I think is the person that I was okay. listening to. And he was giving like an interview and he said, no, at 8 a.m. in the morning, I go and I sit in front of my computer and I have to write for three hours or like 6 a.m., some stupid time yeah. basically. First thing in the morning, that's what we do. That's all I do for four or five hours before I interact with the world. And that's Anything. how creativity shows up. Yeah. Creativity shows up when I assign the time to it or something like that he said or some version so of it. Good. But it was literally like that's how you get creative is because you say now it's time to be creative. It's, there's no other <laughs> science to it. Yeah, you yeah. demand it out of yourself over three, four hours, whatever time it is. And, and it just shows up then because now you're expecting it. Otherwise yeah. it would just never show up because there's no, there's no other way to get creative but yeah. to say now it's creativity. And the first 20 minutes might be a struggle, but then your mind, your soul, everything regulates yeah. to it. And then you go, all right, now it's, now it's a download for the next two hours, yeah, whatever that is. Yeah, what we're doing, we're in flow. Yeah, so I love that. One thing that comes to me, which you, which you shared previously, is that you hired a coach, which helped you build a business, of Heck course. Yeah. And somewhere I think I heard that today you work with like five different coaches. I could yeah. have gotten the number wrong. Tell us more about it that. It could be more. Um, I have an unlimited budget for my health and my personal development. Mm -hmm. We should find somebody that's achieved an outcome that we admire and study them. So that's all I did. When I, when I you know, read this book called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, and I said, oh, that's kind of the way, I don't think I know that. I hired this guy, Bob, he was a certified E-Myth coach, and he helped me on that journey. And that's kind of what I did for a while. But then, then when, this is the funny part, is I was struggling in other areas of my life, and I never even occurred to hire coaches for them. But I'm like, what's the pattern that's allowed me to win repeatedly in business that I'm not applying to other areas? And it was that. So then all of a sudden I hired, you know, a triathlon coach. And I was like, well, this works. And then I hired a swimming coach specific. So it was like, even within a discipline, I'm going to hire somebody that's a specialist, right? Mm -hmm. I hire uh, a health coach, a longevity coach. I hired uh, a family coach. We have a parent coach. Mm -hmm. We have a coach that's got 30 years helping parents talk to teenagers. Mm. Okay, our kids are 11 and 10. We're getting a little ahead of it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, give me your frameworks. And I know what I look for. I, I like, and, and people are like, how do you find these people? Go on YouTube, go on TikTok, go on what, honestly, people creating the content to help you deal with the thing, just click their link. You'd yeah. probably be surprised. There's a call, get on a call with me or there's a, a fill out this thing or whatever. So a lot yeah. of the coaches, what I love is many of them, almost all of them, honestly, they're people where I discovered them. I almost felt like they were presented to me in the right times. Mm -hmm. Right. Like even meeting you long time, I think it was Camp Maverick when we first met yeah, yeah. and just like listening to your story and your experience. And at that time I was starting SAS Academy and you know, you were kind enough over the years to like meet up with me and share that perspective. Like, I just think, you know, oftentimes the people are right there mm -hmm. that can help you, but you just got to do the click, reach out. Hey, I'm in San Diego. Do you have time to meet up for breakfast kind of stuff? Yeah. And, um, yeah. So today we have, I mean, Essentially, 
these are, there's people we work with actively. There's people that are available to us. Like we have a family coach, Brooke, when we feel that it's timing and we want that, like when we look at kind of the things we're working on, we'll fly her up. She'll live with us for three days at a time. She wakes up in the morning, watches the whole interaction, does things with our kids, does stuff one-on-one -on -one with my wife, one-on-one -on -one with me as a group. Cause that's what you do in a professional sports team. Like people are like, that's crazy. You have a coach come live with you and watch how you interact with your wife and your kids and then give you feedback. It's like, how is that crazy? If I wanna be a world-class performer in anything, you record the thing you're doing, you review it with other people that are great and world-class at this, they give you feedback, then you go do it again, you try it differently, see if it had a better outcome. And if it does, you consider adding it to the response next time that happens. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you, those three days are some of the best investments I could ever make in my f being a father, being in a relationship with my wife, just even being, just understanding me better. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have, I have, and then I work with Ed Milet right now. He's like one of the top coach. He calls me a civilian. Mm -hmm. okay, he, he only works with, civilian. yeah, because he only works with celebrities and, and athletes. Yeah, okay. So I'm a civilian and, and we talk and it is, it is the funnest thing in the world to have somebody who's already not only built like the business in life, but his presence and the way he entered, like if anybody listens to his podcast, like he's just got this really unique way of doing it. It's why it's one of his the top ones out there and just spending that time with him. And honestly, people go, what do you learn from him? a lot of stuff, but I'll tell you what I get the most from. And this is what I try to do for my clients, his belief in what I'm doing. Hmm. Right, I, I don't know who said it, but they, they said once they go, the transformation happens at the transaction. Mm. Here's why. The moment you write the check, you send the wire, you commit to that, that is when you've just told yourself, I'm worth it. Yeah. So the transformation happened at that point, approve, send. And yes, the calls are gonna bring value, but I would argue for most people, if they're present of what they just said to themselves is I am worth investing in. Yeah. And that is why I have an unlimited budget for my personal development, because I know everything that goes into that comes out 10 X. Cause I, I trust me. Yeah. You know this man, most people don't trust themselves. Yeah, that's the biggest struggle. That's yeah. the biggest struggle. That's why like you listen to conversations like this as well. So you can go, oh, that person struggled with the same thing. Now mm -hmm. I can maybe borrow some trust totally. here because I'm thinking the same way or I'm acting the same way or I can take this for me, which is also why I, I know a lot of people struggle. They may not be able to afford to add my lad coaching them, but you can afford a book. You can afford, he and that's how that, I yeah. learned. Yeah, you can afford a podcast. It's yeah. for free really, mm -hmm. um, but then become not passive about it, like Study. be invested in it. Because yeah. let's say you can't invest in money, but you can invest in time and that's a big investment to make. Mm -hmm. Like know that that's not just worth, oh, I listened to this podcast and I got absolute jack shit about it. Like, no, like really listen to it because you can't afford, let's say to hire Dan or to Ajit or to anybody or Ed Milet or whoever we are talking about. Yeah. You can't afford to hire them, that's okay. You can listen to this conversation, you can get the tools, you can get a book. You can get the tools. At least you can get started. And and it, it is very similar. I don't have a budget for health and, and personal development. Me and Nita both do not have a budget. We're like, go whatever till the time we align that that's what we're doing. This is uh, sorry aligned to the goals that we have for, for the year or for the next five speed. years, 10 years. It's, it's speed. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. The, the sooner we can become the people we will become in the future, the faster we get to enjoy that. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's yeah. why people are like, I'm like, how fast, like, okay, so you want to achieve this. Why? So I can do this, this, and this. Perfect. How, let's, let's compress that compress the time. so that you can start living that future now because I want to do that in my 30s and 40s, not my 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, yeah. It's like, okay, so everything's about speed yeah. so that we can, we can pull into our current lives those futures. Absolutely. And I feel a lot of times when you feel your life's kind of being – you know, a little bit more stable and feels like every day is the same. It's because you have not invited that compression of time. Mm. And that's why a lot of people like there's this famous code. Most people live till 80, but they die at 25 or stop growing or stop living at 25, whatever the code is. Yeah, they don't but bury the point them really is, until they're 80 or something. Yeah, yeah, because because it's just that you start to settle and you stop asking yourself these questions to saying, hey, how can I get to the life 
that I always rant about. And it's okay you get some failures. It's okay you'll get some defeats. You'll get your ones. But chase and keep chasing it. Get the right support. Get the right book. Get the right coach. Get the right person in your world so you can keep growing. Mm. And so those defeats become more like stepping stones versus defeats that you're like, oh crap, I can't do it. No, you can. And it's a journey and it's never a straight path. It's always going to be fun, uh, multi-dimensional path. Just, just invite the right conversation. Mm. And um, that, that kind of uh, reminds me of one, one more thing that you, that you say, which is, and this is kind of a segue, but unlimited predictability is more valuable than intermittent quality. Hmm. And I love this quote, and I wanted to reflect on that because it, it, it is something that we find really, especially newer entrepreneurs, even like the first three million entrepreneurs, I feel like once you cross the three million threshold, I get you, you get a little bit more comfortable, I think, with it, is they have this idea of perfection this idea that they hold on to so tight say mm, i need to get this so perfect before i can launch and i feel that's kind of what you're addressing here yeah i mean what happens for people is they're they're in many ways they're using that as a self-sabotaging behavior to never win right? The perfectionist is just procrastination in disguise, right? Like I, the other day I was chatting with a woman on Instagram, which I love doing. Like people message me and they're like, is this really Dan? No, this is Dan. I, I know it <laughs> sounds funny. I wrote a book called Buy Back Your Time. And the last thing you expect me to do is reply to my own. I, but that is for whatever reason, there's just something beautiful about the messaging platform and the people I seem to have conversations with. I'm talking with this woman and she's talking about like, you know, I've got this platform and blah, 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 blah. And it's going to be a billion dollar idea. And I'm like, what have you done with it so far? She's like, well, if you sign an NDA, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> Zero part of me is going to sign an NDA. <laughs> and the challenge that you're having is you're trying to get it so perfect and ready and buttoned up that I'm telling you, there's three other companies right now at Y Combinator, Techstars, and some other accelerator working on this exact idea. And in six months, they're gonna launch and they're gonna end up being the category leader and you're gonna wish that you moved a little quicker because they were just playing with it and not, and not just moving it forward. So like even on the idea of the consistency of things versus intermittent, um, you know, the chase of perfection that is sometimes there. It's kind of like salespeople. Cause when you, when you, when I wrote that, I was kind of thinking of salespeople because a lot of entrepreneurs think that they're the only person that can sell what they sell. Hmm. And I'm not saying they can't. And every once in a while they just pull out magic. There, there's, there's no rhyme or reason they don't even have professional sales training. They just do it. And there's a lot of charisma and there's a lot, my, my co-founder Ethan used to call me sell Martel. <laughs> yeah, I get on a call trying to do personal develop or uh, customer development, and the whole time I'm selling, and I don't even mean to do it. And then, and I'm like, oh, they just buy. He goes, you didn't learn anything. You just <laughs> literally ask them questions to get them ready to eventually take a credit card. And I was like, all right, I gotta stop doing that. But that actually doesn't help a business because there's no predictability in it, right? There's no consistency in it. See what happens at scale is then you hire people and you train them and they have a process for doing what they do. And even if their win rates are 20, 30% less than yours, right? Their ability to sell isn't as high as yours. The consistency in the business is actually what you're after. Okay. Cause when you're involved, it goes like this and then it doesn't, and then it goes good. And then it doesn't, what we want is that predictability in the activity. So that's, that's kind of where I, I was thinking when I thought of that statement. Yeah, and I, I feel my rule is when you hire, hire for 60 to 80% of what you can do. Yeah. Because most of the time, what I realize, and, and a lot of times our, our students are more in the range of first 3 million. Okay, perfect. right, And they're, they're trying to go past that. And sometimes there are absolutely new people who have sold a company, were top executives, and now starting a company, that kind of a thing. Or they've built a company, they've gotten to the level of 3 million, now they have hit this glass ceiling but they're like, we don't know what to do. And that's usually due with talent because they're not able to either attract or they're constantly fighting with the talent that they've hired because they go, oh, but you didn't do this right. And this is not up to the standard. Mm -hmm. And they're just constantly battling the talent versus understanding that that's not the gig. The gig is get 60% and have three of them if you feel that that's not what is the achievement that you want them to unlock? And if you get 60% of three, they still will do 180%, which is about 80% more than what you can do. Yeah. And you have no time involved there, or you're doing 
one eight one is what I call it. You spend the first ten or ten eighty ten. Yeah. Ten percent of your time goes into saying this is the vision, go do something with it. Yeah. Eighty percent is them doing whatever they need to do with it, and ten percent is you saying that's great or that sucks, and then go back to the first ten percent. So yeah. we make sure that the cycle is complete. But it requires only ten and ten, which effectively is let's say if time is a hundred, you're only putting twenty to get a hundred result. Yeah. All right. So that's kind of how I approach it. To, to create the same kind of dance that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, in the book, I, I talk about the 80% done by somebody else is 100% freaking awesome. Oh, that's so good. But, yeah. but and the reason why is because while we're doing this, somebody else is doing stuff to support your dreams and your goals and move projects forward. So even if it's at 80%, it's an hour that I didn't have to invest. And I, I remember like some of my friends, they get frustrated, same thing. They're like, oh, this person messed up, this person messed up. Hey man, can we talk about what you were doing while they messed up? He's like, what do you mean? I said, well, you were with me on this heli <laughs> skiing trip for three days. Yeah, you should thank that person, okay? Because while they were doing that, you were with me, we had a lot of fun. And yeah, it might not have been, again, it's that they're literally complaining about the last 10%. Yeah. Hey man, just be like, Coach them out. And again, it's not a people problem. It's a process problem. It's a process problem. I always ask, do we have a people or a process problem? It's a process problem. Cool. Stop, stop getting upset at the person. Okay. Yeah. At some point it may be a people problem, but it's quick delineation, solve the process and then get back to building the people, right? I believe we build the people, the people build the business. Yeah. And I feel if it's a people problem, sometimes if you fix the process, the people usually leave. Yeah because they can't follow the process. Yeah. They're like, oh no, this is too much, too Takes hard. To the they're problem, like, yeah. they automatically go, this is not the company for me. I'm like, yeah. great, <laughs> this is not the company for you. Great, yeah. it's clean, it cleans up the people anyways. So I, I have a thing that it's actually setting up the 10X vision that you talk about that, that I wrote and I just wanted to say it. An average person lives about 30,000 days in their lifetime. Most of us consider ourselves successful or unsuccessful based on what happened yesterday. We question our abilities based on how some, somebody, someone responds to a 60 second reel. Live your life as to have infinite time. Maintain the urgency in the now and enjoy the ease of life as it unfolds. Success is arbitrary and life is infinite. Dream 10 year dreams, act like there is no tomorrow. Live like the only moment that matters is now. Mm. And I was inspired to write it when I was reading the 10X vision part of you, uh, of the book. And it's so congruent to how I also think about my life. I think in seven year or eight year cycles, a little yeah. different than 10, because I find that's about the time when I feel like I need a reboot, usually in my business, yeah. uh, or in the way I've structured my life or my health or something in my life where mm -hmm. it feels like it's getting mundane or it's getting too obvious. And like I shared, I as much as I enjoy the certainty of things, I love the uncertainty and the dance of life. And, and I love how you, you frame the 10X vision that you set up, I think you said for 10 years from, from what I recall. Yeah. And I love it because most of the time when I ask that question to our students or our listeners or people that I coach and, and work with, it's never that they know where they're going 10 years from now. It's very rare to find a person that still wants to hire me that knows where they're going. And that is so fascinating to me. It's, it's cool for a lot of reasons, okay? And I can tell, it's almost like, so I said 10, and I'll tell you why. I think for a few reasons. One, the more I talk to people, especially the folks that are in that range, that zero to three million, one to three million, they don't realize that if they just dedicate a decade to their vision, magic will happen. See, we're more seasoned. And we know for us, the rhythm is seven years. There's something magical about it, right? So in many ways, I wrote 10 because I knew who I was writing for, but people that are further along understand that. And I think I actually give myself permission to say, hey, what if I only had seven years left? Mm -hmm. Every year when I plan, I assume I only have seven. And every year I reset. So I got another seven <laughs> next year. I'm going to have another seven, but it, cause it's enough. It's a long enough period of time to do something meaningful, but not too long to be wasteful. Right? The, the dedicated decade is just a beautiful frame for people that have a lack of clarity on their vision. Right? Cause I think, and, and, and this is my favorite thing to do with my friends or people I'm talking with is if we can get a hundred percent clarity on what you're trying to create, 
because most people don't. And this, and this is like most people, including entrepreneurs, if we can get a hundred percent clarity, which is, can you describe your future to the same specificity as you can your current reality? Hmm. So if you can tell me what you're trying to create in 10 to the same degree, you can look around your room right now and tell me about your business and your life and all that stuff. Then we have clarity. Then if we can have a hundred percent belief, that we can create that because a decade's a long time. Like that's why I chose 10. You and I can do shorter time career because we're like, we know what we can do. But for a lot of people, they have to suspend disbelief a little bit because it just seems too fantastical. So, hey, let's go 10. And that's a long time because you're, let's say they're 36. Okay, what were you doing at 26? Uh, nothing with my life. Perfect. Look what you did in 10 years. Imagine knowing everything you know now projected to 10. Okay, so now they have clarity. I use that to get the 100% belief. And then the third thing is 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So if you can have 100% clarity, 100% belief, 100% of the time, I believe that's the formula to pull forward into your current life, that future. So wonderful, so wonderful. And I also feel when you have long-term clarity, you end your short-term chaos. <sighs> That's the you go. yes to the no, the no to the yes, right? If I know where I wanna end up, then I can say no to things that are saying yes to my 10X vision. And if I don't know what that is, then I'm accidentally saying yes to short-term things that are saying no to that 10-year vision. Wonderful, wonderful. So here's a quote that you have, which says, smart people don't get rich because most people overcomplicate things. And you don't get rich by overcomplicating things. You get rich by putting minimum effort in solving a problem. Mm, I appreciate you bringing that up. It's very simple. Anybody who's been building companies for a while, the reason why they always default towards simple and simple and simple is because they've learned that simple scales, complex fails. Mm. Like you can almost tell the maturity of the entrepreneur based on the uh, mount they'll push back for simplicity and innovation. If you look at the most beautifully elegant solutions to the world's most complicated problems, what makes them beautiful is their simplicity, right? Because complexity is easy. For example, like if you run an event at the end of every event, you ask everybody on the team, what could we have done better? And they give you a list and they say, next time we're going to do this list. Okay, cool. So you had the first event, then you do the second event, then you have a new list. You add all that stuff to the first event, then you do the next one. Was it better? Yeah. Now you have a meeting. You say, hey, next event, what should we get better? They give a list. Everybody puts their opinion. Team's bigger now. There's more opinions. Now we got 15 things. In the next event, we have all the stuff from the first event plus the stuff we added to the second event. Now we're on the third event. And all, guess what happens at this point? All of a sudden, the things that were really table stakes, name badges, registration, getting the room blocks, all stuff, they, they suffer. Why? Mm -hmm. Complexity, right? Because nobody had a filter for understanding what is the core of what we're trying to accomplish, what is the problem we're trying to solve, and let's do that better than anybody else in the world. And anything that isn't that, we say no. And people are like, well, Dan, shouldn't we always make things better? No, not, not if it's not your core, then no. And here's a great tool to help people. If you're going to add two things, let's go three things. If you're going to add three things, I want you to tell me what you took away. See, in product development and software, adding any link, any feature to the product starts with negative value. As soon as you add a link to a, a page, to an app, you have added complexity, cognitive overload to the visual complexity of the screen. So in adding a feature that you think is going to be valuable, adding a button to a screen to enable that feature, you immediately start with negative value. So mm -hmm. that's why in the world of product development, we're always asking ourselves, what can we take out? What can we take out? Because if we leave it in there, it's complexity, it's code debt, it's mm -hmm. It's something we have to maintain. We have to have a help article for it. Somebody on the support team needs to be trained about it. So there's like over time, if you don't prune, you just end up with this really big complicated ball of complexity. And that does not scale. If you look at the Chipotle's and the Ge Geico credit, you know what I mean? Like all these businesses that are at scale, it's because, I mean, Steve Jobs comes back into Apple and says, no, <laughs> it fits on a grid. Yeah. We're doing this and this and this and this and everything else. I mean, did that require letting a lot of people go and reach tool and everything? Yes. But what does that mean? Now we have this beautiful, simple model. We can move forward. And I think it's scary for entrepreneurs because they're trying to grasp to success. So like 
anything that sounds like better is like, of course I want to do that. You know, I'm a fitness guy. I want to add meal prep for my customers. If I, if I take care of their meal preps, they'll never have to worry. Then they'll get results. Okay. Well, they'll probably not do it themselves. So I'm going to do it for them. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get somebody and we're going to do the meal prep. I'm going to, I'm going to charge them uh, 1500 bucks a month. And for that, they get to train with me for two days a week and I'm going to take care of all their food and I'm going to create something that's never existed. I've never heard anybody doing this before. I'm going to create this thing and that's going to be my offer. That's, and you're a fitness guy that barely has enough time to run your gym. Mm -hmm. And you're going to start a whole different division of making food. And you've never heard anybody else do this before. There might be a reason why. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't even run the gross margins on it. So like you yeah. could do the whole thing, actually maybe kind of win and make no money. Complexity. Absolutely. And how much role do you feel complexity plays or comes in because of the desire to make more money? I think it's in the short term. It's make more money in fear of not being competitive, fear of not innovating. It's fear of not having a product that people appreciate. The fear of looking too simple. Dude, you know what's mm. you know, some people are like, oh, you know, this is this is, again the event. It's like, you know, maybe we should uh, I don't know, get uh, fidget spinners on each table. Maybe we should uh, get a swag bag. Maybe we should. And, and then everybody, and of course those things would make the experience better and the customer should appreciate. The problem is, is that in that complexity, you introduce the potential for not doing it, which then creates a worse negative experience because the last one, I go to this event. I remember, what was it I was doing? Oh yeah, this uh, in the book I talk about it. I, I there was this bike store that I used to buy all my triathlon bikes from, and these bikes are you know twenty thirty thousand dollars, full carbon electronics, like massive investments, aerodynamics, and I had there's like different bikes for different things. You got the TT bike, and you got your your triathlon, and all this stuff. And he had a belief that when I went to his store, he had to shake my hand and greet me. He was the owner. This thing, they probably did 3 million in revenue. It's a big, big complex, 25,000 square foot. And he wanted to be at the front door to shake my hand. Dan, how's it going? How's the family? Mm -hmm. And I was like dealing with the maintenance guy where he didn't get the part ordered, blah, blah, blah. Somebody didn't pay attention. And the new bike I ordered got delayed because they forgot to get the right size. And I'm just like, dude, I don't need you to shake my hand. <laughs> I need you to go up in your office and run this team or empower somebody to do it because you're not doing it. Yeah. So sometimes we focus on the things that we think are the reasons to, that, that we're successful, yeah. but we don't actually sit back and assess like, is, is it in spite or because of, right? Mm. Am I being helpful or am I being harmful? And I just haven't associated the right belief around that activity. He thought that was how he became successful and maybe in the early days, but I would argue it's probably because he had the right product. He hired good people and they did what they said that they promised. Yeah. And as soon as that starts to move, Hey man, reduce it, clean it up. Cause if not, you'll just hit what I call the complexity ceiling. And that mm -hmm. will be the point where you keep bumping your head against it until you work through it. And then you get to find the next ceiling. Wonderful. Wonderful. I love that. I love that. And, I think one of the things, and I, I wanted to kind of go to the previous question a little bit because I do think your long-term vision does play a role in you not complicated things. Mm. Uh, because a lot, of our, a lot of our listeners would be people in personal development, in coaching, or some of these fields are, are entrepreneurs as well. And they tend to add services because whatever they are selling- All the time. They go, oh, I don't have enough. My, my Rolodex is not full, so I'm just gonna add a service. Or my Rolodex is full, but I'm not yeah. making enough. Yeah, yeah, I would add an agency on the top of my marketing <laughs> consulting or something like that. And that's because they get distracted because they don't know where they're going. One of the questions that I do get, and but one piece that people do struggle with is when we say paint a 10-year vision and have it the sense of clarity that you talked about you should have on your 10-year vision, they go, I got nothing. Here's the reality is most people don't give themselves permission to dream. Mm -hmm. Dude, all of this, like we take things so seriously. We make it such a big deal that we worry that if we dream, what if I get it wrong? 
What if I say my desires out loud and now you hold me accountable to it. And then I, and in a year you ask me how I'm doing about this crazy thing I told you I wanted to do and I don't do it. And now I got to feel like I'm like, I'm less than here's what I would encourage people to consider. Worry about the, the where and don't worry about the how and care more about the feeling in the thing. So people are like, I want to be a billionaire. Why? So I can have freedom. Why? Why? And then at the end of the day, with the, somebody said this recently, they said, billionaires want to be Buddhists, but Buddhists don't want to be billionaires. <clears throat> There's a reason why is at the end of the day, we want to create a future and have a vision so that we can live in a certain state, like a certain vibe, a certain energy. And that energy is freedom. It's creative freedom. It's feeling fulfilled. It's expressiveness and all these things. So the fun part is you can live that today if you go on the journey, but it, it's easier if you, if you tell, if you have a point, like all I can guarantee if you don't have a desk, like if you don't have a target, you won't hit it. And if you want to talk about waste, it's going this way and then that way and then that way, like that's wasteful. You want to talk about not having any time? It's not understanding how to say yes and not prioritizing and sequencing, right? Sequencing equals success. So people have a hard time dreaming because they're worried about, well, I don't know how to do that. And I would say, focus on the where, disconnect from the how, give yourself permission to dream. And I always ask people, wave a magic wand and I'm not going to ask you to do the work. Mm -hmm. And if you're having a hard time there, let's pretend you're asking, a friend is asking you to help them. That's sometimes mm -hmm. a better way to role play. So I want you to paint a vision. You know who you are. Pretend you had a buddy that was just like you. What do you think they could create in 10 years? Mm. Oh, that person, geez. And they know everything I know. Yeah, they have all the same relationships, know everything you know, have the same desires as you. What could they create in their most powerful, expressive, expansive self? Well, geez, a lot. Like they're starting there and they go there. They would probably do this, 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 and this. How does that feel for you? And they're mm -hmm. like, oh, that'd be cool. Could that be it? Well, I don't know how. S stop. Know how. And then give yourself permission to be wrong. Dude, nobody's, I never hit my 10 year target 10 years prior when I hit it. There were things that happened, but guess what? Some of the stuff I gave myself 10 years showed up in a year. Some of the stuff that I wanted, I ended up realizing I didn't want it or I wanted them for the wrong reasons. And I gave myself permission to change my mind. All I say is you can change your mind every year, every three, if you want, as you learn more, right? Strong opinions, loosely held. That's, you know, uh, you know, often wrong, never in doubt. Like that's my life. Okay. I just like, but what I know is not having that is going to cause a lot of waste. That's true. And, and I love that you also say do a year at least yeah. to that, to that 10 year vision, because yeah. often what happens is 10 year vision, that document sits in some Google doc somewhere <laughs> never look at it. that you never look at it. Yeah. Uh, but, and so again, you get distracted with whatever's at you, whatever somebody says, this is what you gotta do, which is of course, thanks to all the beautiful platforms we have around us at all times, we have so much information and insight at all times that it feels like whatever we are doing is wrong and somebody else has the right answer, but it's not true. It's just, they probably gave enough time to it that they have built something and now you're aspiring to them, but you can build that too. You just have to give yourself enough time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, where can people find more about you, about the book? About uh, I appreciate this so much. Dan? Yeah, I mean, Buy Back Your Time is the best place to get it because I have extra resources I couldn't put in the book. So worksheets and frameworks and models and templates and stuff. And then what I wanna do, Ajit, for you in this audience, because I feel like these are my peeps. That's who I wrote the book for, the kind of the zero to three, is follow me on Instagram send me a message and ask me for my executive assistant playbook, but mention the podcast because if not, I won't send it. And I will send you the direct link, no opt-in, no nothing to the Google Doc sanitize, obviously. But in that, I've got stuff that I, that I show in my playbooks, like our five North Stars for my executive assistant and just all the areas of my life that they support me on, not just professionally, you mentioned it earlier, also at home, also personal, because at the end of the day, time doesn't like where it, it's like, oh, that's this bucket. No, it's your calendar and the energy you bring to that work is what's going to allow you to express yourself at the highest level. So I'd love to give that to people if they want it.
Thank you so much, Dan. Go ahead, go to buybackyourtime.com, get the book. It's a phenomenal book. I read page to page really quickly because I was just so involved in it. Uh, and then, of course, send a message to Dan if you need that checklist for your EAs or just 100%. home management, which is probably what I am sending yeah, the that message video, Instagram. right in the back yeah, yeah. of it because I'm like, damn, I need the home one for sure. Yeah, I got uh, it. Because we could, we could use some help there. But thank you so much, Dan, for taking the time. Appreciate it was a pleasure you. talking to you. Honor.